see everybody finally back together. Oh, we really have a lot more people, but there's still some that's going to wait a while. So we're here in, in God's house and uh, glad to be here. I do have to admit, I had, had to shine my shoes this morning. I hadn't shined them for three months. You know? so, anyway, um, just a couple of announcements uh, we'll go through. One, uh, Brian's going to instruct us on how to use the individual cups. Also, make sure you put the communion cup back in the Ziploc bag and seal it so it doesn't spill on the pew. And then following the worship service, you bring, there's two trash cans in the foyer. You can bring your own individual bag and put it in the garbage for us and then none of us have to pick it up. Also, uh, we ask that um, as soon as church is over, that we go ahead and exit the building, we can congregate outside, but not inside the building. So we're trying to keep the building clean and sanitized. So anyway, let's continue remembering our prayers. Uh, Mike Howard, he, he's really needing our prayers for, for strength and comfort. <clears throat> also, Teresa, she's leaving uh, Wednesday morning in the Anderson for test. We want to keep Teresa in our prayers. <clears throat> One of Sister Cheryl, as she continues to struggle with cancer. Uh, Eddie, Eddie is in the Lady of the Lake Hospital in Bad Rouge. Uh, certainly want to continue to remember him in our prayers. Rachel's home, home recovering from surgery. And uh, Miss Karen, she's at home uh, recovering from her recent stay in the hospital. So let's keep all of those and certainly uh, others that we know in our prayers. <clears throat> Isn't that neat? We've been wanting to do this for a while <clears throat> anyway with the uh, songs up there. Certainly want to thank Brian and I know TR for uh, setting this up. So you don't even have to pick a song book up. So certainly appreciate that. But uh, I'm nervous. It's been three months. It's been three months since I've, I, I've led singing at my house with my family, but uh, it's been three months here. But it's like Harold said, it is so good to, uh, three months is a long time to be absent from, from services for sure. So certainly thankful that we can be here. Certainly uh, glad to see the person that's here. Let's get our song books out and we'll turn to song number 283. A very appropriate song as we uh, start our, uh, restore our worship service. Song number 283. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise
please. Our Heavenly Father, we're so very thankful that you've granted us the health and opportunity to be out this morning for the first time in a long time. Thankful for just the opportunity to be together and the fellowship with one another that we've missed so much. Pray right now that you be with our nation and the stress that it's under right now. Be with the leaders and those that we're subject to, that they make good decisions, that um, this civil unrest will be quelled in the near future. Pray that our leaders always do what is good in your sight. I also ask blessings on all of our number that are sick this morning, be with Karen, Mr. Ed, Cheryl, Mike Howard, be with Teresa, she goes to MD Anderson and she'll have a good report. Right now to be with uh, Terry's Elite singing that Brian will bring us a message that's useful to each of us in our Christian lives that we might then be able to glorify you in our community. For all these things I ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Before we uh, give thanks for uh, the Lord's Supper, take the Lord's Supper, let's turn to song number 151, song number 151. Let us sing. Jesus, keep me near the cross, there a precious
see the uh, wafers in the very top right here, and there are two tabs. There is one very thin cellophane tab at the top, kind of clear. Uh, they should not be stuck together, but they're a little lot, but it is kind of thin. You'll pull this top all the way back, uh, and that will uh, open up the section with the, uh, with the bread. Uh, and then after uh, we protect the bread, uh, we'll have a prayer for the, uh, for the fruit of the vine. And then the second tab, the thicker tab underneath, you'll pull that all the way back. Be careful with that because it can kind of jerk real hard and may end up with some uh, juice on your, on your lap. So um, if you want to go ahead and open up for the, uh, for the uh, bread, uh, we'll have a prayer for, for this and we'll also take that. Let's pray together. Most righteous Lord and Heavenly Father, we come to you now and we thank you so very much for this day that you've given to us. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to be gathered back together around this table. Father, we thank you for this unleavened bread, which represents uh, the body of your Son that was hung on that cross of Calvary. Father, we thank you for his willingness to uh, leave his uh, home in heaven, his place by your side, to come to this world to live as a man and to die on that cross as a criminal uh, in order that we might be able to be free from our sin. Again, Father, we thank you for uh, all these blessings that we have in his name, and we ask that you help us to partake of this bread in a manner, manner that's worthy of the sacrifice that, he's, that, that he made and in a manner of, that is worthy of the calling with which we've been called. We thank you for all these things, and we lift up these prayers in this most holy and precious name. Now we'll give thanks for the cup again. Like Brian said, be kind of careful with that other tab um, so you don't spill it on the pew. So just kind of be careful with that. Let's give thanks for, uh, for the cup. Heavenly Father, as we continue around this table this morning, we give you thanks now for this fruit of the vine, this emblem, which to us represents Christ's blood blood that he shed on the cross at Calvary, the blood that washes our sins away. And Father, we know that even while we were sinners, Christ came to the cross to die and shed his blood for us so that we could have hope of eternity with you. And now, Father, as each one of us partake of this emblem, let us examine ourselves. Let us remember the sacrifice that was made for us. Let us remember the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Of Jesus Christ, and let us take of this as you would have us to do. All these things you ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, David's going to uh, say a prayer for our uh, collection. I know there's a table on the back. And when you come in, or when you leave, you'll be able to put your collection in that plate there. But David will go ahead and offer a prayer for the collection. Thank you, Lord, this day and the opportunity to be back here and fellowship with our brothers and sisters in one place. And we ask now to give back to you our, our monetary gains of, of this last few months. That you will bless it and bless the giver and also help us to understand that this goes back into the community. Father, you're churching on this in Zachary and around the world. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Now before I listen this morning, let's turn to song number 300. I keep saying turn to the song. You don't have to turn to the song. You just gotta look up. Uh, I have to turn to it though. Song number 393. Off we come together. Oh, we come together. Oh, we sing and pray. Here we bring our offering on this holy day. Help us, Lord, thy love to see. May we. Oh, in truth and spirit worship. 
interpretation song this morning will be I Am Resolved, and that's song number 89. I'm not sure how this works in front of people anymore. <laughs> uh, let me do, get this going here. We'll just go ahead and record. Um, we are broadcasting live on the Facebook church group right now. Uh, so the camera right there. I'm used to the camera now. Uh, I've been preaching in front of the camera for uh, about two and a half months. Um, it's great to be back. Uh, it's great to be preaching on a Sunday morning instead of about 11 o'clock on a Saturday night. Uh, in case y'all didn't know, uh, I've been up here on Saturday nights uh, pretty late recording uh, recording the lessons. And the reason why I was up here late is because with the camera where I had it set up to catch me and just the monitor over here to my left, if the sun hadn't gone down, I'd get too much of a glare on the camera and it would wash everything out. So that was one reason. Uh, plus, I wanted everybody uh, who, who ever wanted the lesson to have it available for them on a uh, on uh, Sunday morning instead of having to wait until 12 or 1 when I can finally get everything processed and uh, and put back together. So uh, I am glad to be back uh, in front of, uh, like I said, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, it took me a couple weeks to get used to you not being here, but I'm already used to you being back. So uh, we need to fill everything back up uh, and get this uh, coronavirus out of the way uh, and fill everything back up uh, and then some. So uh, we're certainly... Uh, Certainly glad to be back. Um, I do want to, uh, and this lesson kind of fits in really well with uh, with what I've been preaching on and the fact that we are back today. So I do want to go ahead and uh, and continue kind of the idea of, of how we're supposed to treat one another and this idea of, of loving our neighbor. Uh, because this is extraordinarily important. This is the second greatest command, right? Uh, when Jesus was asked uh, what the greatest commandment was, uh, he, he answered once, and then the, the scribe uh, uh, in another occasion answered that the greatest commands were this, were to love God, and the second was like unto it. Uh, it was to love your neighbor as yourself. And, and why was that second commandment like the first one? Well, it's because uh, we want to be like God. God loves us, so we should love one another. Um, and plus, we have all been created in the image of God. Uh, and so there is something similar there. There is something that belongs there when we talk about loving one another uh, and Jesus saying that that's kind of like the first commandment, right? Uh, and so when we look at one another, we shouldn't see the differences. We shouldn't see the distinctions. We shouldn't see the problems. We shouldn't see what separates us, but what we should see is what binds us together. And that's our, our shared humanity uh, and the fact that we have all been created in the of God, and so we should look beyond the external, uh, whether it's the physical appearance or the circumstances or uh, anything else that divides us so we can love one another. The uh, lesson I, I, I recorded a, a week or so ago, uh, you know, talking about Jonah. Jonah was sent to his enemies, uh, and, and Jonah was required by God. Um, Jonah didn't want to go, by the way, in case you didn't catch that in the book of Jonah. Uh, Jonah uh, was... Uh, requires an extraordinary, extraordinary discipline uh, in order to, uh, in order to finally go to Nineveh, uh, and and he got mad because uh, the Assyrians were saved at least for a little while, for 120 some odd years. They they stuck around a little bit longer till the Babylonians came and, and kind of trounced them. You know, Nebuchadnezzar is the one who finally took uh, took out the city of Nineveh, right? Uh, so we see some divine justice going on there through uh, through Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, and, but but uh, God, God was upset with Jonah because Jonah wanted those hundred and some odd thousand people and all their property and all their cattle to die. Uh, and that's not how we are to interact with the people around us. Uh, we are to, to show our love for them uh, because God loves them and we love God. So that, at, at minimum, is where we need to start. Now, the lesson today uh, that we're going to be talking about is from Matthew chapter 18. A lot of times when we think about Matthew chapter 18, we think about um, uh, Jesus telling us how we should handle offenses that occur between brothers, uh, right? So if your brother offends you, you go to him. Uh, if that doesn't work, you carry two or three more with you. If that doesn't work, you, carry, you put it before the congregation. And then at the end of that, after Jesus has said that, Peter asks a question, and that ties directly into the next parable 
uh, that Jesus is going to teach here. And so we, that's where we pick up in verse 21. And so after Jesus says, this is what you have to go through, and if a person will not repent, if they will not, uh, if they will not ask for forgiveness, then you put them out of the church. So Peter asks a follow-up question. This is connected directly to that in verse 21 and 22. Uh, you can see, Terry, I don't have, I'm, I'm used to not telling people to turn there because I do have that up here. Uh, uh, so uh, we start in verse 21. It says, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. Now, Peter is, uh, is trying to get, you know, trying to get a, a clear answer here for a couple of questions. We're going to talk about those in a second. But Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times, or 7 times 70, uh, depending on the translation that you're reading, both are legitimate interpretations of, of the original language there. So when we see what Peter asks, we have to ask the question, what was Peter really asking about, right? Um, there's an old thing in business school called QBQ. What's the question behind the question? Uh, and so I got a couple of head nods there. Uh, some people have heard of QBQ. Uh, and so we want to ask, what is the question? What is Peter's real question behind the questions that he just asked Jesus? Uh, and so what was that real question? Well, the first part of the question is, do I have to forgive? That's really the first question, right? Do I have to forgive? Well, uh, Jesus just told them what you need to do if someone will not ask for forgiveness, if someone will not repent. Well, Jesus, can I jump straight to that? Okay. Remember, uh, some of these guys, some of these apostles uh, were, were uh, hotheads, right? Uh, and so they were really ready to, ready to, to move along. We had uh, the sons of Zebedee, also called the sons of thunder. Uh, and then we have Peter. We know he was pretty impetuous, right? He was the first one to speak up. He was the first one to draw a sword. He was the first one to walk on the water. He's ready to act. He's ready to strike, right? So do I have to forgive? And if I have to forgive, how much do I have to forgive? How much? Uh, do I have to forgive seven times? Remember, seven is very symbolic. It's complete. It's fullness. It, it's all the time. Uh, so how much do I have to forgive? If he offends me once, twice, three, four, seven times? Jesus, do I have to forgive him on time number eight? Is there a point where I can stop? I'm just tired of dealing with this guy. Uh, he, he's, he's asked for forgiveness. He, he's, uh, he's got some problems. He's asked for forgiveness. He, he's been sincere, but he keeps, he keeps on. Uh, he, he keeps on causing me some problems. He keeps on offending me. He keeps on doing this. And, and I don't understand why he's doing it. Is there a point where I, where I can stop? And Jesus, of course, says, no. <laughs> you, as long as he, uh, back up a little bit here, as long as he keeps sincerely asking for forgiveness, we need to keep sincerely forgiving. That's hard to do. That is very hard to do. That takes a lot of discipline. That takes a lot of self-control. That takes a lot of understanding. That takes a lot of being more like Christ than a lot of us really want to be. What did Jesus do to forgive? He went to the cross. He didn't just say, okay, I forgive you and try to, and try to forget and move on. He went to the cross in order to forgive. And even while on the cross, he offered forgiveness for people who did not yet know they needed to repent. Forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they're doing. We're being asked to be like Christ. The good parts, they're all good parts. And the rough parts, the easy parts, and the difficult parts. So yes, we can, we can show love and we can show compassion and we can show mercy, but we also have to offer forgiveness because they go together. Now Jesus continues on here uh, as he's uh, trying to answer Peter's question. He also wants him to understand the question and to understand the answers to the question. Uh, and so Jesus being Jesus, Jesus being the master teacher, goes further into the need for forgiveness, the need for mercy, the need for compassion. Looking at verses 18, uh, chapter 18, verses 23 through 24, he says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed 10,000 talents. Now, 10,000 talents is a lot of money. 
okay? 10,000 talents is, uh, I think, depending on what the talent is, gold, silver, whatever, could be upwards of about $12 million, okay? No joke here. Uh, if it's silver, it's going to be considerably less. If it's gold, though, it'll be, it'll be about $12 million. This guy is not going to be able to pay this off ever, okay? All right, so he, bring, he, he finds the one that he um, uh, owed $10,000. And since he could not pay, his master's or, master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children uh, and all that he had and payment to be made. Now, this guy uh, lived in a day and time, Jesus lived in a day and time where there was still such a thing as debt slavery. If you owed a debt, you couldn't pay. Even under the old law, you could sell yourself into slavery in order to repay the debt. Now, the Hebrews had a limit to that, seven years. And in the seventh year, you, you could be turned loose. You were, you were released or should have been released from the slavery and from the debt. Now, you could stay at the house if you wanted to. Uh, that's where, you know, the nailing the ear to the door, and now you're part of the family. Uh, but uh, the, the Romans did not have a limit to that. Once you were sold into slavery, you were in slavery until you repaid the full debt or you died. That was it. Uh, and it was uncommon, but not unheard of, that the entire family goes into slavery in order to pay the debt. And so this is a pretty serious this is a pretty serious thing here. This is a pretty serious event that's going on here. This man is about to go into slavery for the rest of his life. So the servant, verse 26 and 27, so the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. Not likely. <laughs> Not likely at all here. Uh, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. He didn't just give him time. He saw this man, he had mercy, and he had compassion on him, and he forgave him the entire debt. Now, there's some specific motivations that we see from the king here. There's some very, very specific motivations. And we see these motivations reflected in Christ. We see these motivations reflected in God. And so what were his motivations? The first thing he wanted to do was he wanted to recognize the debt. He went through the books, he started settling the debt, and he came across this guy, and he says, hey, this guy owes me a lot of money. Let me talk to him. Bring him before me so we can see if this debt is really accurate. And it was. And this man came to him, and he, he understood it, he recognized the debt. The second thing the king wanted to do was to rectify the debt. You owe me a lot of money, now it's time to pay. I can't pay, all right? Off to the slave market you go. Well, of course, this, this man who owes this 10,000 pounds rightfully freaks out. There's no other way to describe that, right? He's panicked. He's like, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I need some more time. I, I, need, I can try to pay this off. I can do this. I can do that. Uh, but there was, there was no way. There was no way that was going to happen. So everything he had was gone. Family was gone. He was gone. Everything was gone. But you see, there was one more motivation that the king had when he sees this man and he sees this debt and he sees his situation, that it was a very bad situation for this debtor. The king wanted to show mercy and compassion. This was already, obviously, some trait that belonged to the king. It was already within him. Merciful people don't just all of a sudden become merciful people because one person who owes them a great debt gives them a sob story. That doesn't happen right away. If we don't have an attitude of mercy and compassion to begin with, we will not show mercy and compassion when we have the, the ob obligation or opportunity. This king also sought to understand what was going on with this man. For some reason, he understood the story. Why did this man get into such great debt? Why was this man unable to pay it? Why did he get all the way up to 10,000 talents? That's a lot of money. But the king understood that he couldn't repay it. He understood the problem and he forgave the debt. 
Because one of his motivations was to show mercy and compassion. Now, if this is where the story ended, I don't know that Peter's question would quite be answered. But the story continues. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. Now, here is the first difference between the two servants. The first servant owed an impossible amount. A lifetime worth of work as a laborer, or even as a businessman, a merchant, you may never be able to pay that back. A hundred denarii, denarii was a day's wage. Three months, four months worth of work, and we can have the debt paid off. Clearly, within a short period of time, this debt could be paid off. This debt was much, much smaller by an exponential factor than what the original servant owed. But instead of, of, of trying to understand, he began to choke him, grabbed him by the throat and began to choke him and say, pay me what you owe, pay me now. He was shaking the guy down. He was like a, a loan shark. The mafia wouldn't have been, you know, would have been proud of this guy. 29 and 30 says, so his fellow servant fell down. Sounds familiar, right? And pleaded with him. Familiar again, right? Have patience with me and I will pay you. Sounds exactly like what this guy was going through just a couple of verses ago. He refused and went and put him in prison. Again, debtor's prison. Until he should pay the debt. The guy that was just begging for mercy was unwilling to extend it. The guy that was just looking for compassion is unwilling to extend it. The guy who, who was seeking understanding was unwilling to extend it. So what are his motivations? What are his motivations here? Well, we see his first motivation was to recover the debt. He wasn't looking to settle an account. He was looking for money. He said, this guy owes me 100 denarii, and I'm going to go get 100 denarii from him. He was looking for the guy. The king was looking to settle the books. This guy was looking for the other servant. He was going after him. You owe me. I'm coming to get you. And he was also looking to exact judgment. You owe me. You can't pay me. Off to jail you go. Off to debtor's prison you go. Now, had he let the man loose, he might have gotten the money faster than he would have had he been thrown into prison. Well, and things would have worked out a little bit better for him than they do in the end, right? But we see here, he was looking to exact judgment. Now, again, this was also very bad for the debtor. You don't want to go to debtor's prison. Uh, people die in debtor's prison. That's why they were outlawed and banned uh, hundreds of years ago. You get into debtor's prison, you never get out. He was also motivated to refuse mercy. He was motivated to refuse mercy. I am not going to show you mercy whatsoever. That's my motivation. He was seeking compassion earlier, right? But it was not within him. He was seeking mercy earlier, but it was not within him. He wanted the king to understand what he was going through, but he's not willing to understand it. And so he throws this other guy in prison. Now, the story continues. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master, that would have been the king, uh, all that had taken place. Now, they see... That this is patently unfair. This man just got released from a 10,000 talent debt and he's choking and imprisoning a guy over 100 denarii? This isn't right. Now, normally, um, I always loved it when we were raising the kids and the kids would come up to me and go, that's not fair. They no, it's not, but guess what? <laughs> Deal with it. This is patently unfair. This is unfair on an objective standard. This isn't a uh, 
one kid getting a, you know an extra slice of cake or something like that, right? This is this is patently unfair, objectively unfair. This is not just from perception. And so they're distressed, greatly distressed. And they go and they report everything that they had seen to the king. When his pastor summoned him, now the king is back involved. The king is back involved again. When, then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant. Here's exactly what happened. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. You pleaded with me. Please don't throw me in jail. Please give me some more time. Please let me try to pay this off. And I forgave everything. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? Shouldn't you have been like me? Shouldn't you have done the same thing I have done? Shouldn't you have shown that same kind of compassion, that same kind of mercy, that same kind of understanding, that same kind of forgiveness that I just showed? And in his anger, righteous anger, righteous indignation, his master, the king, delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. Okay? If you're not willing to forgive, this is the point Jesus is right home, right? He says so in that. If you're not willing to forgive, I am going to rescind my forgiveness to you. It's gone. It's gone. So now, instead of being able to be released from that 10,000 pounds and to release this other man from 100 denarii, now you are bound until you pay back that impossible amount, which means he dies in prison. Eternally separated from whoever, his family, the king, the fellow servants. Gone. It's all gone. The king was forced to take action because of this man's unforgiving heart, because of his lack of compassion, his lack of mercy, his lack of understanding. The king was forced to summon the wicked servant, calls him back before him, calls him back to the judgment seat, right? We all stand before the judgment seat. This man is called back because of his bad actions. He's forced to question his motivations. Why did you do that? You ever get, remember when you were a kid, or maybe you're still a kid, you ever get questioned, why did you do that? I don't know. I'm convinced a lot of people really don't know. <laughs> I just did it. I just wanted to. And it just seemed like what I needed to do. That just, it, it was just my impulse. Well, you know, those aren't always right. Um, your gut is not always right. Step back. Take a look. See what's going on. Why are you doing this? Well, because I wanted my hundred denarii. Maybe it's greed. Maybe this guy was serving money instead of God. Seems to be. We don't get the full, a full answer to that question. But we understand the reason behind the action is vital. Why are you doing this? Jesus doesn't give us the exact reason but we see the motivation behind the action is a problem. Why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you saying what you're saying? Why are you acting the way you're acting? What is your reason? Well, I didn't like that, so I acted this way. Well, what he said hurt my feelings, so I acted this way. Well, uh, this person sinned against me, so I acted this way. Well, um, I, I, you know, I'm free to express myself however I want to, so I acted this way. Really? We're called to be bound and obligated to be like Christ. Oh, and if somebody tells me, well, Christ overturned the table with the money changers. Well, you know what? You're not Jesus. I'm not Jesus either. I can't act like that without understanding. Period. We have to know, we have to understand our motivation. Why is Peter asking the question that he's asking after being told about forgiveness? Well, he wants to know, where's my limit? And Jesus said, there is no limit, and here's why. What this person has done to you is about a hundred denarii 
worth, worth of offense, but what you have done to me is worth your life. Who are we to hang on to all of this? And finally, the king was forced to condemn the wicked servant. Off to jail you go. Off to outer darkness you go. Off to eternal separation you go where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 35, Jesus explains the parable. There are times where Jesus doesn't explain the parable. There are times where people ask Jesus to explain the parable. Here in verse 35, Jesus makes the explanation of the parable very, very clear. And I would imagine he's locking eyes with Peter <laughs> when, he's, when he's saying verse 35. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. You have to forgive, and you have to have the right motivation to forgive. You have to forgive, and it has to be sincere. You have to forgive, and you have to be willing to move on past it. It's hard for us to understand why people want to hang on to old offense. It takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of effort to hold on to old offenses, old grudges. And to, and to dislike or disdain or even hate a person for a long time, it eats up a lot of your day, a lot of your energy, a lot of your strength. And at the end, it doesn't serve you well. It doesn't allow you to, to move beyond where you're at. We have to be ready and willing to extend mercy. We have to be ready and willing to show compassion. And I didn't put it in the title here, but we have to have some understanding. We have to know what's going on with the people uh, who we think are offending us. Because when we know what's going on with them, we may recognize, hey, that's not an offense against me. It's kind of a sport today to be offended. I mean, how, how offended can I get today? I saw, I saw a thing on social media yesterday. Uh, a uh, guy's standing there, his arms are outstretched, and he says, what can I find to offend me today? When we go looking for it, we're going to find it. And our reactions to perceived offenses are, are very rarely tempered with grace and mercy and compassion and understanding. And we can't do that, not as a children of God. So what does this mean for us? There are a few things I think that we need to have in place when we're thinking about this. First, we have to keep our motivations pure. Why are you doing what you're doing? Why? And if the answer to the question is, I don't know, then you need to sit down and you need to spend some time thinking about it. You need to spend some time praying about it. You need to spend some time meditating about it. You need to spend some time clarifying what you're doing and why you're doing it. Understand your motivations. You have a motivation whether you recognize it or not for doing what you do. I have seen people respond to political movements over the last few weeks. I mean, obvious what we're talking about, right? With all the racial animosity. And folks will say, I don't understand why this particular group is, is saying the things that they're saying. Have you asked? Well, what this particular group is saying, uh, it doesn't make any sense because uh, all these other things are important. Okay. You, you may be right, but is, is that what you're addressing? I'm going I'm to put it to you like this. This would be being upset with somebody else or expressing their distress at a situation would be like the heart association getting mad at the cancer society because more people die of heart disease than they do of cancer. Are there people dying of heart disease? You don't send somebody who's got heart disease to an oncologist. Are there people who deal with cancer? Yeah, we have both groups right within our congregation. You don't send a cancer patient to a cardiologist. 
we deal with the problems that are out there because that's a problem. And you don't ignore it because there are bigger problems. And I will assure you that people are aware of the bigger problem. Why are we fighting against that? What's your motivation for that? We have to think about that. We have to understand. We also need to seek forgiveness when we are wrong. Now, I struggle. I have to tell you, I struggle to put these in the order that they ended up in because they, they fold over, they carry over, and, and I don't know which one's more important. Maybe motivation is more important, um, but, but the rest of them are, are kind of mixed in because they all come across, and they all kind of uh, come across one another. But we also have to be willing to seek forgiveness when we are wrong. Both in, in this parable, and it wasn't the point of the parable, and I understand that wasn't the point of the parable, but in this parable, Jesus pointed out that both servants recognized they owed the debt. The first servant recognized he owed the greater debt, and the second servant recognized he owed the smaller debt. They both recognized they owed the debt, and they both pled for mercy. I know I owe you the money. I know I owe you the debt. Please give me time to try to make it right. Roughly the idea of asking for forgiveness, right? More time. But if we don't recognize the debt, we're not going to ask for forgiveness. And here is the thing that separates the two servants and, and explains the master's actions. is because the first servant, even though he recognized he owed a debt, he recognized he needed forgiveness, he did not recognize the idea of forgiveness for someone else. That's like Jonah. I want God's protection for Israel, but I want God to knock Nineveh to the ground. And we said, man, Jonah was wrong for that. We are too, and we follow suit. And so we have to seek forgiveness, not just from God, but from one another as well. Whether it's a body within this congregation or a body outside of the congregation. When we are wrong, and we understand we're wrong, we need to seek forgiveness. We need to seek to understand others' plight. That kind of goes back to the motivation. I don't know who said it. It, it might, have, honestly, it might have been me. I may have come out with it saying myself. So feel free to quote me. But I, I tell people, seek to understand before seeking to be understood. Have you ever gotten into an argument and you want to explain yourself? No? Yes? <laughs> and, and you're so busy trying to explain yourself, you don't hear what the other person has to say? Uh, that causes a lot of interpersonal issues. A lot of them. Seek to understand where the other person is coming from before you seek to force them to understand you. I don't understand why oh, somebody wants to do this when I want to do that. Well, I want to explain to them why I want to do that, but I have no clue why they want to do this. It doesn't make anything right. It doesn't make anything work. And so when we're thinking about that, when we reach out to somebody else, the king was willing to hear the first servant. You know you owe me all this money, right? Yes, I know I owe you all, all this money, but... This happened, that happened, this happened. I had this problem, I had that problem, and, and I can't pay you right now, but give me time and I'll try. He wanted to be understood, but he didn't want to understand the second servant. That was a problem with his motivation. And that was a problem with his forgiveness. And finally, we need to be willing to forgive others Now, I understand, and I preach, and I teach what Paul said in Romans. As much as is up to you, be at peace one with another. Sometimes, some people will not let you live in peace. That happens. And that's not what I'm talking about today. When that happens, we may have to separate from them. I don't need to be around you. You don't need to be around me. We can forgive everything, and, and we, can, we can live away from one another. 
But ideally, we should have peace. We should have unity. And we should be willing to forgive others' wrongs. That's extremely important when it comes to loving our neighbor. And I think that's the culmination of loving our neighbor. That is where that Christ-likeness in our life really shines, is in our willingness to forgive someone who has done us wrong. And again, maybe we can't reconcile the relationship, but we can forgive the trespass. Maybe we can't uh, be, be brought back together in unity, but we can offer forgiveness. Why? Because I have, forg I have been forgiven of so much more. And because that person is also created in the image of God, that person is my neighbor. And I am to love my neighbor. I am to love my neighbor because that is like loving God. And it's the second greatest command. And the one that Jesus emphasized even over the, the Ten Commandments. And so when we think about compassion and we think about mercy, we also have to think about how much of that God has shown us. And we need to be willing to extend that to others. And we need to be willing to accept that in our lives. So if you're here this morning and you are not yet a child of God, if you're here this morning and you need to be forgiven of your sins, know that we have an opportunity to, to take advantage of that this morning. We have an opportunity to ask for forgiveness by hearing God's word proclaimed, by believing in Christ Jesus as the Son of God, by being willing to uh, repent of our sins and confess name, uh, Christ's name before men, and then we can be baptized in order to have our sins washed away. But if you're here today, you are a child of God, but you have uh, not lived as you should, and you need to be forgiven of those sins, you can do so as well by asking for his forgiveness, uh, making it right as much as you can with, with anyone you may have offended, and God will forgive you again. So if you're here this morning and you have any spiritual need, won't you come as together we stand and sing our invitation song? I am resolved no longer to linger, shorn by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad.
song number 15, Amazing Grace. And it's got a lot of verses. And they're all here, right? Four. Four. I'm going to try to turn around and see if I can pick the, the right four. We're, we're going we're gonna to make accommodations for that going forward. So. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I try to leave what's there. Uh, again, it's good to, good to be back. Uh, I was fixing to say certainly want to invite everyone to be back tonight, but we won't be back tonight. And that's just a matter of time because I know when the men met, uh, you know, our next next step is is to, to get Bible class back for our kids. Uh, soon we'll be trying to get Wednesday night back. So as time goes by and the coronavirus eases, then we'll be back with all of our service. And we also look forward to that. We certainly want to remember those that were listed today, those that were mentioned in our prayers. We look forward to seeing everyone back next Sunday at 1030 for our worship service. Song number 15. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved.